Good morning, class. Good morning, Good morning Brother Keith. Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, where I learn how to be an overcomer. Now, we, we say this almost every class. We started off like this, not just to be filling time. You want to, it's faith school. You want to release some faith from the very start that we're not just doing something for our head or taking a little bit of time, but this is what's happening beginning right now. That's why you want to make it a personal confession and say, my spirit is getting fed. My faith is growing stronger. I'm learning how to be an overcomer. Hallelujah. Everybody say it out loud again. My spirit is being fed. Hallelujah. My faith, My faith is growing stronger. Is growing stronger. I'm, developing. I'm developing. I'm increasing. I'm increasing. From faith to faith. From faith to faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm learning how. I'm learning how. My mind's being renewed. My mind's being renewed. And I'm learning how. And I'm learning how. To think. To think. Talk. Talk. Walk. Walk. Live. Live. As an, overcomer As an overcomer in Christ. In Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Not, not I, I want it to be, not I need it to be, not I wish it would be. It's happening. It's happening. This is happening. Yes. It's happening. And if you don't want it to happen, you need to turn this off right now. But don't. <laughs> Because that's what happens Amen. when you become a part of faith school. <laughs> I mean, who wants to be stuck in unbelief? No, no, no. In Hebrews, the third chapter, if you'd turn and look there, please. Hebrews 3. And also we'll be going to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10. Hebrews 3, 7. I'm reading the New Living Translation. He said, the Holy Spirit says today... When you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. Or the King James says, they, they tempted me. It's written, Jesus quoted it to the enemy in the wilderness. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And we're going to be learning more about this, but just say it out loud. You shall not. You shall not. Don't. 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 Tempt the Lord your God. Now, now, God cannot be tempted with evil. That can't happen. So what's he talking about? We'd probably use the word test. Don't try to test God. Why would you need to say that? Are, 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 is there anyone trying to do that, you think, today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You ever heard this language? Prove to me. Hmm? Prove to me. Well, see, they're, they're trying to test. They're trying to test God. And what did the scripture say? Don't do that. Don't do that. Why? Because you are taking a stance of unbelief. You're saying, I don't believe it. You're going to have to prove to me. Well, like we were talking in the last uh, session, yesterday's session, um, what would it take to prove it to you? How much would you have to see? How much would you have to experience and understand? Because the truth is, faith doesn't come by seeing. We saw with the Israelites all these miracles and yet still refuse to believe. Faith is a choice. Huh? Being unpersuadable is a choice. Fear is a choice. Faith is a choice. Somebody say, I choose to believe. I choose to believe. I choose to believe. He went on to say, verse 9, in the New Living, he says, Your ancestors tested and tried me, even though they saw those miracles. Um, verse 15 says, Remember what it says today when you hear his voice. Don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. 
We, we see this repeated like three times right here in this one chapter. You're going to see it in other places. So say it again. Don't harden your heart. Don't, your heart. Don't test God. Don't test God. See, the, these are things that an evil heart of unbelief does. And that's a quote from that same chapter. Look in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 1 Corinthians 10. He talked about, verse 1, Brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. They were all baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual food. They did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ. So everything that happened to them, we're told just a moment later here, is an example, example to us, and what we have in Christ. Well, he says it very plainly here. It wasn't just a sign and wonder that water came out of that rock. It wasn't... Uh, just a, a demonstration of God's power. It wasn't just God's people's need being met. He could have done it so many different ways. Why do it that way? Why have it come out, the water come out of the rock? Because that is a perfect picture of the waters of life Amen. coming out of the rock, yes. the Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. And so all of their, you know, dealings leading up to that and then their responses, most of them were wrong, uh, are lessons for us about our provision in Christ. And so we can respond correctly to the living waters of Christ or we can respond in an unbelieving way, incorrectly. He, he goes on to say that. Verse 6, all these things are our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things like they did. Don't be idolaters like some of them. Don't commit fornication like some of them. Don't tempt Christ like some of them. Don't murmur like some of them. And murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them for examples. And they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Isn't it amazing that God, who sees the end from the beginning, portrayed things in this material world that uh, prophesied and foretold the culmination of all things in the end of the world. This is, again, why you should not neglect your Old Testament. Because even though you're reading in Exodus, and Numbers in Deuteronomy, they didn't realize that they were portraying it. But you're also reading about the fulfillment of every prophecy in Christ. And you're reading about the, the completion of God's plan and the end of the world. In Exodus. <laughs> How many believe there is so much here we have not seen? And not understood. But you won't see it for sure. If you never even look for it. Uh, seek. And you shall find. So let's go back to Exodus today. And, and seek some more. Let's look some more. Seek. And you won't come up empty. Seek and, and you'll find something. Exodus. We started looking in, in 14 at the 10 uh, incidents of unbelief that led to the people failing to go into the promised land. And we saw the, the situation at the Red Sea, the first one. The situation at Marah was the second one. And then in the 16th chapter here, there were actually three, four, and five in this same chapter right here. Uh, in 16... They murmured against Moses and Aaron, kept talking about, you know, they wish they had died in verse 3, and how good they had it back in Egypt. Wow. How good they had it as slaves, being beaten, being abused, and used like cattle. It's, it's amazing. 
how people can have such romantic ideas about the past. Huh? <laughs> and, you know, you can, you can re-remember <laughs> things <laughs> any way you choose to. Doesn't make it so. Uh, it, it should have been the most exciting time of their life. Right? They're getting to do something their parents could only dream of. Right? Yeah. And their grandparents and great-grandparents, you know, for what, 400-some years. They, don't, they could only dream about what? Free. Yes. Free man. Free woman, healed, yes. got money, yes. got money, yes. money. They, when, the, when God brought them out, he brought them out with silver and gold, Amen. the psalmist said. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Yes. That means a lot of people got healed and everybody got money. Does that sound like God or not? Yes. God says, we're going on a trip. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, yeah, you need to be healed. For this trip. Oh yeah, I'll take it. You need some money for the trip. Yes. Amen. Right? Yes. I mean, almost to do anything, you need healing and money. Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, just getting up and getting out of the bed. <laughs> right? And making it through the day. Healing and money. Yes. Hmm? And so there shouldn't be any shock that the devil has attacked those. Oh, he's attacked those for generations now and has sadly convinced much of the church that it may not be God's will for you to have either one. Mm. Healing or money. It may be God's will, you know, for you to be sick. You may be, you know, it may develop your piety, whatever that is. And, and it may, <laughs> it may please God and it's going to work out some things for you to be sick and you suffer with disease. No, no. Healing has always been God's idea, yes. God's plan, God's will. Yes. Hmm? And the same thing with money. You know, money's not the problem. People say, well, money is the root of all evil. It is not. That's not what the Bible said. It said the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And you can love money and have none. Right? Yes. You can sit around and dream about getting money and what you could do with money and not have a dollar. Well, if you can love money and not have it, you could have money and not love it, which is the right way. And the Lord wants you to have everything you need, not only to meet your needs, but he wants you and I to have a surplus, an extra to be able to help other people. Right? If you are so poor, how can you help the poor? Sit out loud. Healing. Healing. And money. And money. God's, plan God's plan for me. For me. <laughs> but, you know, they, they complained and they blamed. And then God said, well, all right, I'm going to take care of you. It's like they, they keep asking for proof that God is here, that God is with us, that God can do it, that God cares about us. You know, they're saying things after ten signs and wonders, after the deliverance at the Red Sea, after the waters of Mary. They're still, still saying things like, you know, I guess God hates us. You know, I mean, uh, he brought us all out here to kill us. And you too, Moses. <laughs> really? And so what, what are they saying? Well, does he care about us or not? This is... The tempting God. We're going to see this clearer as we go. But it's a testing. It's prove to me. That you're real. Prove to me. That you exist. Prove to me. That you care about me. Well what were all the signs and wonders in Egypt? What was the Red Sea? What was the waters of Mara? And after another seven of these miraculous things happen on top of what we're talking about now, by the time they got to Numbers 14, it's when God said, how long will it be before they decide to believe me? 
And the answer was, and he knew the answer, never. With the exception of Joshua and Caleb, two out of two million. That's literally one in a million. Hmm? You know, the Bible said, uh, Scripture said concerning what Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, shall he find faith in the earth. Faith is actually much more rare than a lot of church going people talk, talk like it is. Uh, people, because people have twisted all kinds of things into faith. They'll say, well, what faith are you? And they mean theological position. What, you know, uh, denomination, what, what your doctrine. No, faith in God is not a theological position. It is living trust, living confidence in the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It affects every aspect of your existence. Which is why the just shall live, not, not just go to church on Sunday, live by faith, walk by faith, overcome by faith, please God by faith. Right? It affects every aspect, every bit of your being, your existence, the way you see things, the way you hear things, the way you talk, the way you act and react. Say it out loud, I am justified, I am justified by, Christ. by Christ. And I live, and I live by, faith. by faith. I exist. I, exist. I, function, I function by faith. By faith. Hmm? God's plan, brother, sister, is that you blink your eyes in faith. Amen. Huh? Yes. You breathe in faith. Yes. You eat in faith. Yes. You sleep in faith. Amen. Right? Yes. What do you mean? With a, with a confidence, a persuasion of God's love for me. Amen. Huh? Yes. With an expectation yes. of God doing something good for me. Amen. Man, I like what... Uh, the statement Brother Oral Roberts popularized. He said, something good <laughs> is going to happen, hallelujah, for you today. He's talking about God is going to do something good. My father in the faith said, some folks, he's a contemporary of, of Brother Oral Roberts. He said, some other ministers he heard said, told him, said, I, I wish he wouldn't say that. He said, you wish what? The brother, that something good. He said, how does he know? Something good is going to just miss the whole thing. This is preachers. Huh? Well, these were God's people out here too. Is that right? That had seen all kind of miracles, all kind of signs and wonders. And still, instead of being positive, instead of saying something trusting about God's goodness and existence and love, slide right back every time. Every time there was some kind of challenge, some kind of need, some kind of issue, what do they do? Get mad, get upset, start complaining, murmuring, start blaming Moses and Aaron, other people, start talking about we're all going to die out here. And the big problem with that is you keep saying something long enough, huh? Even if it's completely contrary to the will of God. You keep saying it long enough, you keep believing it strong enough, you'll have it. I said, you'll have it. Even though it is not at all God's will, you'll have it. And isn't that exactly what happened to them? They all died out there in the wilderness, even though it was not God's plan. Not for them. Now, we saw in verse 16, they failed the uh, manna test. Remember that? He said, don't save it. So what did they do? They saved it. Failed the test. And then he said, don't go out on the Sabbath because there won't be any out there. I gave you twice as much on the sixth day. And so naturally, what did they do? They went out on the Sabbath. Now, you know, we find it kind of humorous. It ain't funny to God. Why, why the disobedience? 
because of unbelief. Now, in, in the 17th chapter, we get to uh, number six, I believe. Yeah, the sixth incident in our study of the 10. Verse 17, chapter 17, verse 1. All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of Zin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. So this is number six, uh, what happened at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Is that a problem? Hmm? Not if you have... (laughs) (laughs) Remember now, if you... You're looking for the answer. That's probably it right there. <laughs> uh, Brother Shambach used to say that in some of his meetings. He said, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. <laughs> don't you like that? I'd preach that to myself. Why? Because all things are possible to him or her that believes. Yeah, not having water. Is a problem in the natural. But is it a problem God can't fix? Is it a problem they've never seen before? No. No. This is chapter 17. <laughs> right? Any, anybody remember chapter 15? Right? They came to the waters of Marah and they couldn't drink it. But was it the end? Did they all die? Did they all perish? No. God changed it, and the bitter waters became sweet. Good waters. Nobody died. Everybody's okay. (laughs) And then it happened again that they didn't have water and they didn't have food. Uh, Chapter uh, 16. Did they all die? No. No, Nobody died. Everybody was fed. In fact, uh, they got bread. They got uh, quail. And they had water. Everybody's good. Have they been here before? Yes. Yeah. But then they, they roll up to Rephidim. Everybody's hot and dry. It is the desert. No H2O anywhere that anybody can see. And so what do they do? Can you guess what they did? Huh? <laughs> the people did chide with Moses. Now, the word chide, or you see also the word chode, they chode with him, past tense. That's the King James language. We, we would say they strove with him. They quarreled with him. They fought with him. And actually, you, this place is going to be named the waters of strife. Strife. To strive or they strove means they, they wrestled with him. And, and this, can you see, this denotes anxiety and fear and stress, striving and, and, and yelling and blaming. This is ungodly. This is unbelief. This is a picture of unbelief. And you don't want it. It's contraband to the soul of the believer. Huh? You you need to get strong in your heart and mind, believer, that you are intolerant of this evil stuff that displeases God, that is disrespectful to God, that is unthankful to God, that questions God, that rebels against God. Somebody say, I hate it. I I despise it. it. What are you talking about? This evil unbelief, Hebrews 3 calls it. It's evil. Now, hold your place there and look in James, third chapter. Hold your place there. But in James, he talks about strife. James 3.14, James 3.14 says, If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, reckon this could be connected to hardening your heart? Yeah, Yeah, it is. All goes together. Bitter envying and strife in your heart, that's how you wind up hard-hearted. 
Glory not. Don't lie against the truth. This wisdom, this kind of wisdom, doesn't come from above. It's earthly. It's sensual. It's devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Did you hear that phrase, every evil work, every kind of evil thing? I know uh, years ago when we first started having staff in the ministry, and, and then we started the churches, uh, the Lord dealt with me strongly in a time uh, of prayer and with some things going on, that we were to be intolerant of strife. And he said this to me. He said, strife, just, just like peace is the manifest presence of God and the Holy Spirit, God's called the God of peace. Strife is the manifested presence of the devil. And he charged me that I was, we were not to allow as leaders the manifested presence of the devil in our offices and in our churches. Is that right? That whatever it took, it, it had to stop. It could not be allowed. It's not, not based on who thinks they're wrong and right. We just can't have it because it's God's church, it's God's ministry. The Spirit of God should be manifested. Peace. Is that right? Yes. And joy and love, not strife. And you want to note that anytime you sense strife, you can feel it. You can sense it. It's death. It's evil. It's anxiety. And you, you don't have to know all the whys and wherefores. You just you know immediately, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. We can't have this. This has got to stop. Whatever it takes, this has got to stop. And that's what was going on that day with them striving against Moses and Aaron. Said out loud, I refuse strife. I refuse, strife. I refuse to live in strife. I refuse to, live in strife. I refuse to cause strife. With the help of the Lord, I'm a child of peace. I'm a peacemaker. And I live. In the peace of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our time's up again for today. We'll see you again soon back here in Faith School. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.